What's going on, everybody? And uh, thank you so much for tuning in. So today I am <laughs> uh, super excited. Uh, sorry, I had to fanboy a little bit. Uh, I have my good buddy Jeremy Zoll joining me, but also I have the amazing narrator Colin Mace uh, joining us. Colin has actually narrated Jeremy's series so far, The Common, which starts with Stormblood, and as you can see, Blind Space that Jeremy's got behind him. But uh, fellas, how are you, how are y'all doing today? Yeah, good, good. Thanks. Good, good. Yeah, it's an uh. I'm sure it's been a little bit of a whirlwind with uh, with with Blind Space coming out and uh, and Colin. I know you've got some you've got some filming stuff that's been going on, but uh, but Jeremy, I just kind of want to start with you. How's uh how, how's life been since the release? And uh, you know how how are like, sales going? Good? Are you working on book three yet? Yeah, it's been quite uh, frantic actually because it um, we had to do a bit of a whirlwind dash to get the book out uh, out this year, and then. Uh, all these new COVID restrictions came along. And so I, we got a book launch done down here and sitting with Garth Nix by the skin of our teeth and uh, which, but it went very well. And we got a lot of, uh, we've had some really good attention so far and reviews have been really good. And I'm just happy to have this bastard out the open after all these years. I started <laughs> outlining, outlining it back in August, 2018. And I had to and when I got to the end uh, of the first draft, I realized that it needed to have some serious editing done. So I pretty much spent 20, 2020, uh, latter half of 2019, most of 2020, chopping out and rewriting two thirds of it uh, and to really polishing up to get to the level that I wanted. And, uh, but I'm very, very happy with it right now. And I got the, this is the special purple sprayed edge edition of the book, which looks fan fabulous. Uh, and all the best words in all the perfect order. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I'm just, I'm very, very happy with it. And yeah, I'm, yeah. The, although of course with uh, being an author means that you have to keep writing. And so that means it's straight onto book three, which I am currently probably about just less than halfway through. I'm about 120,000 words into it. About 80,000 of those are uh, usable um at the moment or what i want to have but uh yeah i've just pretty much going to have to plow ahead after these holidays and just get the first draft down but no it, it's going very well and i'm very very happy with the the way the story's unfolded so far man just like the thought of like cutting forty thousand words just like makes me want to vomit a little bit <laughs> i'm not gonna lie just like forty thousand is that's, that's a lot of words to just be like nah just toss this out we're, we're done if you think that's a lot, my editor, the what the draft that I submitted to my editor was 230,000 words. She cut 80,000 words out of it. I have to get a wow. new editor. <laughs> no, but it was good. It was, it was the right decision because then it could, I could focus on what was left and expand that. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about it a little bit later on, I guess. But like, I think that listening to Colin's narration and a lot of audiobooks helped me get an ear for what needs to go and what needs to stay so I actually cut, ended up cutting out a lot of dialogue tags a lot of action and movement between dialogue so it could flow a little bit better like mm -hmm. Colin knows this better than I do but some of the conversations I think had had more of a flow in this book and you could really get like get a feel for the characters and the back and forth the bouncing rather than stopping and starting with um, lots of you know little action or dialogue tags or to have characters just staring off into the distance it was just just meat and no potatoes and uh yeah and I, I think that worked really well and especially listening to the book now in audio uh I think it, it flows a lot better than what I originally written down so I gotcha. what about you Colin what, what have you been up to I know I mean clearly uh you know you recorded and released uh, the audiobook for Blind Space but how how are things going now what are you working on now it's been kind of a strange time, obviously, although um, for a lot of people, the, the first lockdown, which was what, March, end of March 2020, was a real shock to the system for a lot of people. But for actors, it just life <laughs> carried on as normal because uh, you just don't work in the same way as everybody else. So uh, I was able to set up a home studio. Very, I mean, I was advised to do that by one of the audiobook producers that I work for. And I was advised on what equipment to get and... I managed to get onto the internet before it all sold out because it really did sell out. And also the prices started going up because there was so much demand. Mm -hmm. And um, I managed to set myself up with some really good equipment. So I was able to continue right through that 
that lockdown of 2020 really just working really hard it annoyed my family because obviously my kids weren't at school and my my wife was a theater casting director so all her projects basically were postponed straight away which was mm. you know terrible but they all had to sit in their rooms and be quiet while I was downstairs trying to pile through various audio projects, uh, including sort of, you know, like radio commercials and uh, all the usual kind of voiceover stuff, but just the books. And it was there was a lot of demand and uh, people were chucking stuff at me from left, right and centre because I was getting rung up and saying, can we do a test with you from your home studio to see how it sounds I'm like, oh, my God, it sounds great. And I said, why don't they all sound great? And he went, oh, no, he said, <laughs> we get stuff and you just, you know, you can't use it. It's just like it's not usable. But I was I was well advised at the beginning. And then things kind of uh, woke up a little bit. And I did a I went to Italy to do a, a film and um, on Sicily, which in uh, last October, so just over a year ago. And then I went to Belgium in December and then things locked down again and it was a bit tough. But this year has been just been pretty good. Yeah. And I've just uh, um, a film that I was in that I'm in has just come out in the UK. I think it's come out uh, globally. It's called Last Night in Soho, directed by Edgar Wright, who's who's like he seems to be like one of everybody's favorite film directors, because everybody you speak to go, oh, Edgar Wright. I love Edgar Wright because he directed like uh, Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz and uh, Baby Driver, which is I think is a great, great movie. Oh, absolutely. But, um, so he cast me in this. I felt really lucky to get that. And that's just come out. So and, and I've, I've got this, uh, I don't know if you can see it, I've got this little moustache here. I'm doing a thing that's set in the 60s about um, a spy. It's a spy thriller, basically, for uh, for ITV in, in the UK. And it's uh, it's about the spies in the 60s who all defected to, to Russia. So I've got a part in that. But um, I want to talk more about um, Jeremy's work and about these two books, because I have to say they've been two of my absolute favourite projects, uh, to narrate and uh, I can tell you why that is and it's not just I mean it obviously is all because of what Jeremy's written but when you come to narrate an audiobook there's certain things that uh that help you kind of make it an enjoyable experience for you but also hopefully an enjoyable experience for the listener and one of the things um that really stands out for me in these two books is one the setting which is great, and and all the stuff that goes along with the setting, and those of uh, those of you who have either read or listened to the to the books will will know what I'm talking about. The character definition is is, is so clear and uh, bright, and the relationships are often very heartfelt. But you also get this change in tempo, which is a great thing for an audiobook narrator because. If you only get one thing, and I, I do a series, I won't name it, but I do a series which is a kind of like a James Bondy thing, and it's just relentless action and descriptions of guns. That's it. <laughs> That's, so you just get on the, the treadmill on page one and you get off it on page 380, and, you know, I'm just exhausted because it's just like gun battles. But with this, these two books, and I particularly wanted to pick out, um, I don't know how you feel about this, Jeremy, but I wanted to pick out the relationship uh, between the two brothers, between Vakov and Artyom, because I think it really anchors the whole story, the story in both books, really, that relationship. And not only the relationship between them, but the relationship, which has something that everyone can relate to, which is they grew up somewhere else, which has a lot of nostalgia attached to it for both of them and for their relationship. And now they find themselves in, uh, well, in opposition in the first book and then sort of reconciled. And now we're not quite sure what's happening at the end of the second book. But what we do know is that there's a lot of love between them. And there's been, there's needed to be forgiveness. There's needed, so it's a proper, you know, like 360 degree relationship between brothers that anyone who has siblings, I think can really buy into and recognize. And it's very heartfelt, very touching. And we keep, we keep coming back to that relationship in both books. We go off and we have crazy, battles with with the bad guys or they go off on a mission down a tunnel to find something they need to find but you always come back to this relationship between the two brothers and that that's something that I found particularly beautiful in in the writing and therefore in the challenge of 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 narrating them particularly because they they come from somewhere else and they find themselves in this crazy place where their lives where they don't really have control over their lives either of them really but their relationship is the thing that they're looking to to kind of anchor their lives or they want to get back to something and i really really loved all that well um, well thank you i'm i'm um, very very pleased about that and um 
Yeah, I think going back to what you're saying a little earlier about how there are some uh, things that are just relentless. For me, books, uh, it's kind of almost like music and I don't want to listen to a, one song all at the same volume. Uh, you get a song, something like Stairway to Heaven, that starts off really soft and mellow, then gradually increases in tempo and gets really loud towards the end. Uh, and that's kind of my I idea of a, of a good book, that you have these moments of fast-paced, frenetic action, then you can slow down, breathe in the atmosphere, like reflect, recollect, why are we here? What are we doing? And to really focus, as you said, on those pivotal relationships. And that was probably one of the hardest things to get right about this book was to make sure that the whole book was grounded in the relationship between these two brothers, but it also wasn't too sappy and overbearing. But we also understood why that we're jumping into these ridiculous and intense and very dangerous situations. That okay, there's actually something driving us towards it, that we understand why the characters are doing it. And then even afterwards, I think there's one chapter where what Artyom says to Vakov, like, why did you do, why did you do that? Uh, and then I didn't even think about it beforehand. It wasn't planned. And I just said something along, made him say something along the lines of, I thought about you and how you were brave in one situation. And if you were brave for me, I could be brave for you. Uh, and so for even for me, that gave me a lot of insight into the character that I didn't have as much in that area beforehand. Okay, why would he actually do this? Like I, had, because some, well, the way I write is that I try to write the scenes I want to write and I find ways to justify how they got there. Uh, but then it just, it all made sense to me. Yes, that's why he did it. He didn't do it for out of hate or out of the, the necessity to complete the mission. He did it out of love. He did it out of, uh, wanting to do right by someone else. Uh, and so that's what I use to ground the narrative. And I think you captured it really well. In fact, there's one scene towards the end, and I don't want to spoil it, but Colin will know what I'm talking about. It's a very, very heartfelt scene between the two of them uh, talking towards the end where one of the characters wants to do something very bad and he gets his brother to talk him out of it. And I can't listen to it because I know I'll, I might, I'll, I'll cry probably because that scene was very hard. No, because it was very, very emotionally taxing to write uh, because it came from a very personal and strong place. Uh, so I haven't been able to listen to it yet, uh, but I will at some point, but I'm, and I'm sure you've done an amazing job because I've found all the other ones that you've done between them very, very emotionally fulfilling. And, and that was partially why I actually picked you as a narrator, because when I first was asked to, uh, choose who I wanted. And uh, I obviously, I've just listened to a lot of uh, audio books, but then I heard your narration on some of the other books that you've done. And I just thought that you've got the very grounded, gritty, bitter, broken soldier voice, but can also give a, a very authentic, very emotionally raw and emotionally deep and rich texture to it all. And, uh, and I was lucky enough that you agreed to do it. And I'm very, very happy with how they've turned out. Oh, well, that's great. <laughs> that's lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to agree, uh, you know, I've, it's not always just about the voice. Like you also have to have the pacing down and the inflection down and so forth. And I feel like you, you just have it like that. Uh, I, I believe the first uh, series that I listened to you, your, your narration was uh, Empires of Dust by Anna Smith Spark. Uh, yeah. still still is like one of my favorite series wow ever. that was a challenge that uh yeah. And, yeah and like i mean just from like the get-go uh you know to, to about knives knives everywhere i just i can i can like literally hear you in the back of my mind like saying that all the time and let's go oh my gosh this is the guy i'm gonna stick with the rest of my life like this is this is the guy i'm gonna listen to narration for um and then of course listening to to raven's mark by ed mcdonald uh, oh, those were great. I mean, yeah, you just, that's a series. You that's just a series that could teach me to it. take Colin on. That I yeah. wanted Colin. Like I listened to his narration of Black Wing and Raven Cry and Raven Cry, especially. I'm like, yeah, I if I ever write, get a book published, I want. <laughs> to get this book published. I want Colin to do it, and here we yeah, are. There's, so, there's some similarities between those between the two series. I think in some ways, yeah. um, they kind of they both speak to kind of because uh, obviously I'm older than you two, but so they speak to that 1980s sci-fi kind of that you probably look back on, uh, but was probably, you didn't go to the cinema to see them. But, but, you know, films like 
not so much Star Wars, because I think Star Wars is too clean, but something like um, a Blade Runner or even the, the first sort of, even though it's set in the past and set in, it's, they've just, it, something that's got the future, but it still kind of links into you viscerally, but it's exciting visually. And, and the, both both those books, he created the misery, you created the uh, the common, and uh, and so you've you've got these other spaces in which life is just kind of teeming, and uh, particularly in your books, uh, where you've also got just so many different groups and disparate groups of uh, creatures, uh, uh, yeah, beings, let's say, not creatures, all kind of having to coexist. And we, what's, what's kind of great about it is that you, um, when I first read them, I wasn't really sure what had happened to Earth. <laughs> in, in the, but you don't need to know. What you know is it's gone. <laughs> It's gone, and there's been a colonization by human beings, but they've also then encountered all these other uh, species. And I, I found, um, because it's interesting what you, there's so many things that go into making a narration, and, and a lot of it is to do with character, and there are a lot of characters in Jeremy's books, a lot. <laughs> and they come from different places. Now, there's always there's been a tendency, particularly in fantasy, and it's something that I try to avoid, which is if you're a UK narrator, you go, OK, well, these people have Scottish accents and then these people sound Welsh and then these people are from London and then these people are from, some, you know, French or. And I really, really tried to avoid that on these two books. I really tried to find a tone that would sit with a certain species, but then not just make everyone in that species sound the same. So. The kaiji uh, are, are a quite a good example because they are one of the oldest species in the universe and they are very grand. So the ambassadors are very, very grand and they believe that they're better than everybody else and they walk around in their robes and they look down on everybody. So it was, it was natural really to kind of go with a more aristocratic feeling. But then you had... Juvens, who is a kaiji, but is a soldier. And so he is a slightly different version of that species. And so you, you, you're trying, I was always trying to find, without going into accents, sort of tones that would differentiate, because differentiation between characters is massively important if you narrate an audio book, because most people are listening to it, but they may be listening to it while they're driving their car, or they may be listening to it while they're in the bath, or they may be listening to it while they're out in the garden. And so you need to make sure that the listener is aware of who is speaking and who the scene is between. And so that is a really difficult uh, balancing act because if you just choose accents to differentiate between people, it makes it slightly uh, schizophrenic. And also it's not only people from the UK are gonna listen to it. So, so th those accents don't have any meaning for people outside the UK. So you're, that's what I was trying to do. So Vakov, uh, obviously he's got, a Japanese sounding name. So there was a, t a temptation there to take him sort of further east and his brother. But then I thought, no, because they're the central characters and I, that's not my voice. So I was born and brought up in London. So to make them, to give them that urban feel, which the whole book has a kind of urban feel anyway, there's no countryside anyway. They don't, I mean, they, they create a kind of synthetic countryside when they go to certain bars in posh places where there's a waterfall or there's a you know there's a view <laughs> but basically they're on a rock and it's just a mass of, of of beings all trying to do commerce and live and survive and so on and so it was it's a real challenge that but um yeah so you, you just using your my instinct and experience because i've done so many books over the over the past sort of 15 years just to find the right tone for each character uh so that you can um you can differentiate and you can also just bring the characters a little bit to life. And that's obviously can be quite difficult when you're dealing with female characters, if you're a male narrator. But again, it's, it's about not, uh, what's the word? Making caricatures. Don't make caricatures, just make people like you would if you were playing them and then let them interact with each other. And, and when once that voice is embedded in you, because obviously it's about 800 pages or something. Um, so once you start the book, those voices get embedded in you. You don't even have to reach for them anymore. They're just naturally there. You know who those people are and you know what their relationship is. So some of the relationships are really funny, sort of based on banter. Some have lots of sexual tension in them. Some are like two siblings who um, 
uh, sort of have a lot of affection for each other, but also have a lot of conflict. So you've got all this stuff, this sort of, you know, this massive amount of stuff that you're, you're dealing with as you're trying to bring it up off the page. Uh, but yeah, choosing the right voice for the right character really makes the job a lot easier. Yeah, and I, I thought you did that really well. And what you were saying about the uh, the kaiji, the my some of my favorite scenes in the books are listening to the ambassadors and Juvens yelling at each other because like there's so much power in how like the ambassadors are just so fed up and so annoyed at this big horned general that's got no tolerance for bureaucracy <laughs> whatsoever, and listening to him dragging through a verbal slaughterhouse is just delightful listening to you uh, ace that is just delightful and i actually wish i wrote more of them so i could hear more of you do more of them but no seriously out of all the voices you've done juvens is probably my favorite because of how distinct and how rough rough it is and pretty much everyone that i know that i've shown uh, the audiobooks to loves juvens even more so because of how you rendered his voice and uh, and I actually can't imagine hearing it in in in, in any other way. And the same for Vakov. Sometimes when I'm writing it, writing the book now, and I'm writing book two, and when when I was writing book two, when when I am writing book three, I can kind of hear Mr. Colin Mace's voice in my head as I'm writing Vakov's dialogue. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, it's been, it's obviously been tainted, but in a good way because I can <laughs> verbally, I can mentally articulate it. And uh, yeah, and as as you probably know uh, from enunciating all those words and all those different tones and metaphors that I try to make every, my, the books very voice driven. So every word of the narration that's outside of dialogue, it should sound as if Vakov is speaking it, as if Vakov is telling that story, even if it's a description, even if it's just the way describing other people's face, even if it's just as giving a bit of uh, scientific information or some sort of cultural context, it should sound as if Fakov himself is delivering that information filtered through his tone, his voice, his his worldview. Uh, and that's why I think these uh, audiobooks work so well is because of the solid narration that you uh, g gave to them. Because so although that voice, that that voice, that context, sounds so much more tangible when you can actually hear it out loud, hear someone speaking out loud. And it sounds as if it, someone is telling you this information because uh, you are hearing it too. You're not just reading it on the page. You're not reading someone else's stream of consciousness. You're actually hearing it read to you. Uh, and so that's what I, I enjoy very much listening to it. And I usually don't enjoy listening to my own work read aloud. I, I actually find it quite embarrassing for the most part. <laughs> I've had my work adapted by uh, into audio numerous times over the years. Nothing novel length, obviously, because I. But this I I do enjoy listening to it because it's it's good enough that I can detach myself from it. Oh, it's it's not something I wrote. It's just something that you've. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's I've it's just it something that Colin Nays has narrated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do so, like first person narration. First person narration is is a very direct link to the listener because it's the same person speaking. So as so it becomes like a very long monologue, basically, yeah. in which the, the central character is also recreating the scenes uh, with all the other characters. So, so I, I think it's more, it has a kind of real immediacy for a narrator to pick up a, a first person narrative rather than uh, having to have the kind of voice of a storyteller and sort of overseeing the story in the third person yeah. and then kind of having all the other stuff happen uh, being described by the storyteller because you are still reading it out loud. So you're narrating it, but you're narrating it from one step back, if you like, because it's written in the third person, whereas it's in the first person, like these books, you're right there in the in the forefront. You're you're telling the story right from, from word one uh, to the final word of the book. So yeah, it's, it's, it's more, ex I think it's more immediate, more exciting. It's more accessible for a narrator to, to deal with first person narrative. And I know that first person narrative is, was, um, I mean, I guess maybe 10 years ago, maybe uh, for a long period, it, it wasn't seen as a lot of writers I know were encouraged to write in the third person. They wanted to write in the first person, but they were told, no, 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 no. People don't like that. We want to have it. And now that's completely changed around. And I don't know whether that's to do with the proliferation of, of uh, the audio versions of books that, that publishers uh, and editors and people and writers themselves think, 
no, maybe the first person is right for this because, you know, because of the influence of, uh, as I say, the proliferation of audio uh, has made that happen. But it certainly seems to be a more popular way or a more popular way of writing now in the first person rather than in the third person. I don't know. Is that true, Jeremy? And that's kind of my impression. Yeah, I think it is. It's not the only reason, of course. I think one of the other reasons is that um, a lot of fiction these days is so much more character driven and so much more intimate than it used to be. Like there's, I don't really think there's anywhere near as much room for the, well, once upon a time in the land before <laughs> type stories, like the omnipresent narrator, the detached standing back narrator. Like, I don't really think there's as much room for that. And I don't really think it's something that too many re uh, readers want these days. Cause I think that the, the industry has changed and what people expect out of, fiction has changed and th things are a lot more focused on character and a lot more intimate and personal and I think that narration has a lot to do with that and I think the immediacy and intensity of first person and especially when listening to it in audio has really upped up the ante for the upped up the ante and drew a lot of people to that that closeness I think especially as I said listening to it in uh, spoken out aloud and um, so I, I do think there's a lot of truth in that, that the um, being able to just hear those words spoken at you rather than just reading it from a detached, uh, clinical, distant point of view. Uh, I think that's definitely helped it steer more towards first person. Uh, and these days, I think most, not most books, but just generally a lot of books, especially in science fiction and fantasy uh, would be written in first person. Uh, a lot of books, actually, Colin would know this better than I do, but a lot of crime books and a lot of thriller books uh, will be written in first person, but not so much in science fiction fantasy. And I think that the uh, the cross-contamination cross and melting pot nature of genres these days has also added to the mix a little bit. And we've had a lot of, um, you know, like Luke Arnold's books have, you know, a basically a mashup of uh, no noirish Raymond Chandler Esque fiction mashed up with fantasy, uh, with modern fantasy, and uh, that allows for a uh, allows for first person storytelling in a way that we perhaps didn't a little while back when genre is a little more uh, surrogated. But um, yeah, I but I, I do think that yeah, narration and audiobooks has definitely had its influence over the uh, the genre as it should as it should. Yeah, I would say that low fantasy kind of feel, you know, like you said, with Luke Arnold books, uh, even with like Peter McLean. Uh, yeah. which is War for the Rose Throne. Uh, I mean, you, Daniel Polanski, et cetera. Um, they all have that kind of noirish feel uh, with that, you know, barely any kind of magic, but it's it's there. It's not, but it's there. <laughs> um, uh, so so I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Colin, what, uh, what made you start, uh, I guess, down this path of, of narration? Did you, you know, have, have you been doing voiceover stuff for, for years and audiobooks just kind of became a thing that you did or did somebody yeah. say yeah you know your voice would sell really good in audiobooks you should probably do that <laughs> that's basically what happened I think yeah really <laughs> yeah so I was doing a lot of theater I did a lot of theater in my in my 20s and then uh when my children arrived uh I realized that theater wasn't very compatible with family life because you're either away from home or even if you were at home you're basically out every evening and you're out all day Saturday as well because you have like a matinee on a Saturday and, and so uh, I sort of scaled down on the theatre which meant that I was I had a lot more days to fill because you know theatre was like six days a week once you got a theatre job that was it you were working full time basically mm. either rehearsing or you know if you were touring or whatever it was and so suddenly I found myself in a situation where I was at home more um, and so because I because the option was to do tv and film and I had a voiceover agent and said look I'm here so you know so I started to do stuff like radio commercials, TV commercials, whatever, documentary narration. And then, of course, and then this friend of mine, uh, he said, oh, I'm, I'm doing audio, but I'm producing audio books now. You should definitely come and try one out. So um, I went along, this was in like 2006, something like that, when really it was still quite a small industry. Mm -hmm. And it had, it had gone, you know, as we all know, it, it started with basically books for the blind um, for, or for people who are partially sighted or uh, had problems reading. And so that, um, in fact, the first book I did was an adult literacy book. It was, a, it was, an, it was an, uh, written by an ex-soldier and it was a military mission 
in Iraq, I think. I can't remember exactly. It's such a long time ago. But it had to be, it was called a quick read and they were short. They were like 80 pages, if that. And uh, when there was the first one I did and I sat in the studio and I started to read it and then there was the producer and then there was the guy from the company and he followed it because it had to be absolutely accurate, 100% accurate on the text because the people who were going to listen to it were uh, adults, mostly adults, who had literacy issues and were using audio and then following the the, the text mm. so that they could they could hear what these words sounded like because obviously they can they could talk fluently they just couldn't take words off the page because they they hadn't been taught how to read or they somehow that got missed in their life which we we, we all know can happen so that was the first one I did and then um, and that set me on the path to being an ex-soldier for about the next, and it's never stopped really. That's just, that's, you know, most of the audio I do is, is a lot of the audio I do, not most, but a lot of the audio I do has, it has to do with uh, a lot of ex-SAS soldiers writing books about their experiences and then either in novel form or in, in non-fiction form. And that has then been taken forward into this, this kind of fantasy because it has, some similarities also it just needs that kind of edge mm -hmm. especially the you know the lead characters are all you know they're, they're all tough guys basically and but they're flawed and they're you know they're in pain <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so um so yes but I, i've done uh, so then it just and then slowly as the industry started to sort of take off because you know the first books that i did i i remember saying to the producers i said you know how many copies of this are you saying this is pre-audible uh pre-amazon really so I don't even know really what platforms they were being sold on, but you were buying them. Uh, well, originally the first few books, you buy them on cassette tapes. Yep. And then you were I buying remember them those on, days. Yeah. And then you were <laughs> buying them on CDs, right? I mean, you were getting CDs and I, I remember seeing CDs getting printed off like in a kind of factory almost because it was like 14 CDs for a book or something like that. So oh, people yeah. were, and then you could get them in the library the same again. You could, you could take them out of a library and you could listen to them. And then, and then suddenly, I don't know when exactly, around about 2010, maybe even a bit later, suddenly then there was the whole, I've got a Kindle, I can download a book, but I can have the audio on it as well as the book. So I can be reading it and then I can switch and I can listen to it. And now, I mean, it's absolutely huge, yeah. uh, the audio book industry, to, to, if that's the correct word. And so, um, and I think a lot of publishers were worried in the early days that they were going to lose their authors if they didn't also produce their audio, even though they knew they would never make their money back. Because now that companies have got used to making audio books, they can, they can actually use the economies of scale and they can make them cheaper to produce. Mm -hmm. But back then they were an it was an expensive thing to make an audio book. And if you only sold, you know, 50 copies because everyone was buying the book, then you would, but then it just became a thing about keeping your author in house because then once Amazon and Audible started, they were they were saying, well, you can come with us and and we'll do your audio and we'll publish your next book for you. We're massive. We're Amazon. We're Audible. You know. And then the the old publishing houses in London that were rather fusty and old fashioned and still ran on sort of Victorian lines suddenly had to wake up and realize that there was this whole new thing happening. And if they didn't get on board, and so they started to record their back catalogue at an alarming rate i mean it was literally you, you were just drowning in projects and that has calmed down a little bit now that now everyone's caught up and now it's like they're handpicking um the books that they want and they like to they like to release the book and the audio book at the same time that's that's quite a new thing that's like in the last four or five years that you would do a front list book and you would they would both come out you know the the, the, the hardback and the audio book would be, you know, released, launched on the same day. That's quite exciting. I find that quite exciting. I mean, I like that, that side of it. But, uh, and also the volume of sales has just gone through the roof, not for every title, but for, for a lot of, uh, a lot of people now would rather listen to a book than read a book, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just the thing that's, that's a cultural change to do with time, I think. I mean, I don't read as much as I did when I was 25 mm -hmm. because, I just, there's too many other things going on. I don't have the, I don't, you know, I don't sit down in the afternoon and, and read for two hours like I did or read, in, you know, for the, for an evening because there's the TV and there's my phone and, you know, there's stuff. I'm it all comes at. back to the phone. Yeah, I'm telling you, phone. It never so, goes away. So you can see why that cultural change has happened. So many more people now choose to, uh, you know, to consume their literature 
through their ears rather than through their eyes. And so that's been great for me. I mean, it's been a brilliant part of my working life because uh, it's meant that I was able to, to earn money, you know, and support my family when I wasn't um, doing TV and film because TV and film is much more sporadic than long contract theater. So if you go to work for the Royal Shakespeare Company, you start work in January and you don't finish to the following April, you have like a 16 month contract. So you're sorted for 16 months. You haven't got to worry about anything. But if you stop doing that and start saying, well, I want to do, you know, got an episode in this and I'm going to do a part in this film, but then there's lots of gaps. And uh, the audiobook, the explosion of audiobook demand has really helped over the past 14 or 15 years to kind of, yeah, just to, to really occupy me and, and, uh, employ me and it's just been and it's a transferable skill that's the really cool thing for actors about audio work is that you you're not working in a bar you're not working part-time for an estate agent or uh, in an antique shop or you know whatever it is or uh, you're actually using the things that you're good at to produce product that entertains people so you it's the same job and I think that 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 penny dropped for a lot of actors is like I want to do that I don't want to have to go and get a job somewhere. I want to do this thing because that that's who I am. That's, that's what I do. And so that part of it is, has been really brilliant. I think. Yeah. 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 I actually working, I'm, I'm, working for me. You're not working for me. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've you have to say what I time. want you to say, literally. literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, uh, I've found that I've, uh, I've sort of listened to audiobooks at a, at a lot faster clip than that i i guess i would have probably three or four years ago um most of it was to do with like commute so i would you know drive to work i would listen to it on the way to work i would listen to it at work if i had the availability when i'm on my way back home but see now because of the pandemic i've been home for almost a year and nine months so i listen to it while i'm around the house so i wake up throw the headphones in get some stuff done in the morning get my daughter up go throughout that rigmarole come back in here work headphones are in go wash dishes with headphones and whatever because it allows me to to get through more books than i would because i maybe have an hour to two a day to actually devote to reading physical print or a, on a kindle whereas i could i could probably get through eight to say 16 hours of an audiobook because a i could listen to it faster than i can read it <laughs> and, and b because it's 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 a it's almost like two kinds of entertainment at one you're not only getting the book itself that the author has written but you're getting a narration which kind of brings you into the story almost like you know cinematically like a movie would um and i say that about say a lot of the star wars audiobooks that like mark thompson audio uh narrates you know it's got sounds and it really brings you into like like you're watching a star wars you know film um But then you have, you know, single narrators like yourself that can really bring uh, a listener. We're going to say reader, but a listener into the story. uh, And, you know, you can really find yourself caring about the characters and exploring the world and so forth that you may be able to do while reading, but maybe not be able to put as much time into it that you would Mm. a book. Yeah, I I just, I mean, if I I had to go back, like, throughout this year, I, I probably would quadruple if not you know i don't even know what the next number would be times <laughs> listening to audiobooks yeah, and cool. actually reading yeah what, whatever like 10 times is, is is probably where because i think i've listened to all mine at like two and a half clip now and so i'm getting through you know depending on the length of a book a book a day or a book and a half you know every couple of days wow but yeah it's i didn't start out doing that it you know, but if I listen to it at, at speed like one, I, I might fall asleep. <laughs> Maybe I should start doing that before I go to bed. Just listen to it at one and just be like, okay, I can't do this anymore. But yeah, everything everything's at about a two and a two and a half clip, if not more now, which is, it's kind of insane saying that, but it's just like how my mind processes words. And like you were, you had mentioned earlier about giving every character a different kind of voice inflection or or a different tone and so forth and i feel like if you're listening to an audiobook and you're doing something else whether that's something around the house driving you know a commute uh it allows you to continue staying engaged with the story but still being able to focus on what you're doing um whereas if everything's even keel you're gonna lose 
yourself because all the characters mm-hmm. sound the same. The pacing kind of stays pretty monotone. Uh, and there there have been some audiobooks I've listened to that I go, okay, I've got to do this when I have nothing going on. <laughs> yeah. Um, but a lot of the times, you know, I'm able to do just about anything and everything and still keep up with what's going on just because the narration is so good. Um, and yeah, and you were saying, you know, when did it explode? I, I really can't even tell you, but I feel like definitely over the past, I would say maybe five, five to seven years. And that's my daughter. I'm sorry. <laughs> over the past five to seven years, it's really exploded. Um, and a lot of people really enjoy audiobooks now. I think it just yeah. makes it easier to get media. Than- Jeremy, do you think that you write now? I mean, I, I've not asked the writer this, but when now, because when you write your books, you are you, is there a part of you that thinks about how it will sound out loud? Or did you always do that? Did you always read your work out loud as you were writing it to just to, to feel it, to, so that you would know whether you know you you write a, a section of a book and then you read it out loud and you go yeah that sounds good I like I like the way that that's constructed I like the grammar I like the words I've used or did you not do that but now that now you do or do you think about when when you write are you writing for yourself as a writer or are you also kind of thinking about how it's going to sound so maybe there's that's too, the narrative's a bit too heavy there i need to put some dialogue in so that it could i mean what's the process is that part of your process now has it become part of your process um yes and no um i don't i never read my work out aloud um and i always do write for myself partially as well because i the way i look at it is that if i'm not writing something that i like or i enjoy at least on every page then what's the point of it but of course yeah. There is also the the fact that I'm writing for an audience, and uh, but no, I absolutely do consider that the the audio aspect and list, again listening to your rendition of the first book actually really helps me with the the second book because then I knew which characters I think worked, and I'm not saying that it changed the direction of the story, no. but it did, did distill and uh, reaffirm the things that I already wanted to do. Oh, okay. Yes, this is working because the character dialogue here really sings off the page because of the narration. And so I put a lot more of that character dialogue in there. Uh, and I think that I've, there's a lot less description in book two as well. Uh, because I, even I was listening to, you know, some other narrations over the years and not even just my books, other ones as well. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a lot of, uh extra stuff i just want to get to the meat i want to get to the fun stuff and so i'd be listening to uh so i when sorry when i was writing book two i'd be like putting in a bit more dialogue or having a lot more banter here okay i don't just want to have a page or two describing something i want the characters to be arguing about it i want to have the world building built into the the narration and the context and I want the dialogue to be work, the, the world building to work into the dialogue. Uh, and so there was quite a lot of that in uh, book two. And so like there's scenes where the characters are arguing about something or debating something that was originally written in narration. I'm like, yeah, you know what? I can make this work a little bit harder. So I just had two characters argue about it or just had uh, this, just turn the scene into banter, not just because it's more fun to read, but because of the narration. I'm like, yes, this is something I actually want to hear. It's not just a matter of, you know, making it more fun to read. It's a matter of making it more uh, enjoyable to listen to. And it just, it's just easier and more in, yeah, like it's just, the experience is just better listening to characters argue about something or having it embedded into the dialogue. And uh, as I said, there's a lot of scenes where, uh, there will be little, I cut a lot of the little action or little behaviorals or mannerisms slotted in between the dialogue and just had straight dialogue. And I think it works so much better because you just get an unfiltered stream of consciousness almost instead of just stopping and starting. And listening to audiobooks has definitely helped me in that manner. And as well, I think that it's helped me think about what I want to see on the page so there's things that I wrote in the book like insults or people yelling or arguments or like absolutely vicious just soul destroying things that people say to each other that I put in there because I wanted to hear them read out aloud so like I'm like what's the most <laughs> cutting insult I can think of here what's the most 
brutal, savage thing I can think of that I would want someone to say and someone, another character to hear because I want, because the character, uh, the narrator is actually going to read it out aloud. Colin's going to read it aloud. So I'm going to give him a lot to work with here. And uh, there's actually, yeah, there's a quite a bit of few scenes there that I just did think of uh, from that standpoint. It's not just about, okay, I'll write what I want to write. What would sound good? What can I really make it uh, write that can really sing off the page? Uh, yeah, and so I, I quite did quite enjoy listening to those scenes read out aloud because I know that I written them especially uh, <laughs> just for you. Colin, so so Jer you. Jeremy's answer to be concise was, I wrote it just so Colin would narrate it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. No, seriously, there's stuff that I'm like, okay, what could I actually get away with talking about this? Could I get away with people yelling about this thing? Like this whole page where the aliens are arguing that I'm like, okay, I want like these, there's Juven's a really big horned kaiji and there's a smaller, more timid, much more fussier alien called Quinlan. Uh, and I wanted to have them arguing because I'm, um, because I wanted to hear how Colin would do it. And I also wanted to hear, okay, what's the most outrageous stuff that I can get away with? So I had of Juvens, of course, <laughs> talking about all the ways he would like destroy the cultists and like rain hellfire down and on them and all that. Because I wanted to hear how well uh, the, the narration would, uh, it would translate to narration. And the answer is very, very well. <laughs> so you have uh, both of us to thank for some of those things in this book. Yeah, I mean, it does make it a lot easier for an array. It's a gift. You don't have to work too hard. It's there on the page. So once the characters are established, then they're just having an argument. I mean, they're having an argument inside my head. But um, and so it's not like I'm having to manufacture anything because it's already it's already there. And and that's a kind of symbiosis, which is really, which is I think really productive and really really good. Uh, it just yeah, it's just when you come to a scene between uh, Quinlan and um, <laughs> and you Ben's then you know that this is going it's going to be a fun it's going to be a fun moment they all seem to have you know you're very you're very good at that you you kind of you knit history between characters even characters who don't know each other well but because of what they've done in the past there's an instant antipathy between certain characters and then they have to kind of overcome it because they're in a fire team so you know they've oh, they yeah. can't be at odds with each other they have to work together but there's history in amongst those characters things that have happened to them and i particularly like the character of uh grim grim yeah yeah yep. so he is this uh, for those of you who haven't uh, encountered jeremy's work yet he is a kind of he's an outsider a bit like vakov obviously vakov is an outsider too but but he's even more of an outsider he's not really welcome uh, amongst people because of uh, a past history and I'm not going to go into it because obviously it's it's complicated but there was a previous war and he is one of the people that was a member of he wasn't fighting but he was he's from that enemy group and he's now finds himself uh, kind of as part of the establishment inside this fire team and and he has that he he feels that and he's also not a soldier he's he's a tech guy He's a hacker and he's, you know, he's absolutely brilliant. And he is best mates with Vakov, even though they are the total antithesis of each other. And their relationship I found really fantastic as well, because there's just so much loyalty between them. They just will not back down on that friendship. They're going to see it right through to the end, no matter what happens. But it's that thing of having someone feeling that pain of being, and knowing that they're an outsider and wanting, partly wanting to, get inside and partly not wanting to and he really encapsulates that for me I really really like that character a lot I've I found again he was a lot of characters bring heart to the book but he is definitely one of them because he is so complex in the way that he feels about everything that's going on around him and particularly about Vakov and whether Vakov one day will just say you know I don't need you anymore I'm you know we're done and I think that's a real fear for Grimm I don't think it would ever happen, but they, yeah, it's just, so having these, these really uh, interestingly flawed, slightly, um, what's the word, sort of, yeah, they're just, they're concerned about, because the future seems so unsure in your books, because the future is, could just be exploded 
uh, in a moment and everything would be finished and over. And so that preys on all the characters' minds. That's, that's what's driving all of them is how can we secure some form of future for ourselves, which isn't constantly in doubt. And, uh, and then it comes down, so that's the macro of the story, but it's also the, the micro inside each of the characters that they're trying to survive something and trying to find a secure place where they can live their lives. And, and it's very, very difficult. And the only way to do it is to stick together, it seems to me, and try and try and work together to make sure that it doesn't all just explode and there's just nothing left. So th those sorts of things are, are really accessible for a narrator because you've there's so much on the there's so much material on the page you haven't got to create anything. I've done books when you read them and you think there's just there's just there's nothing really here. You know, there's a story, there's plot, but there's nothing else. So how can you get inside it and kind of inject it? with humanity but with excitement with entertainment you know you have to sometimes you really have to work hard to to manufacture something uh with certain books that are put in front of you but but these books had had so much that occasionally you had to say well i i can't fully invest in that because you know at the moment this is the main thing and so this can come in but it has to come in at a kind of at a, at a lower level so that people will catch it but i can't make you know you can't have everything on the same level but there's so much material in your books that you just yeah it's like um it's like a toy store for a narrator really i mean there's just so much there that you can grab onto and characters that you can bring to life and the, the pace of the story and, and you know some great tech in it great i mean i, my, I love sci-fi but the sci has to be the right sci for me you know it has to it has to make sense when i if you see a, um, a science fiction movie and you think this science doesn't make any sense you know I, I i can't i completely disengage whereas the science the science and the logic of the book that you the books you've written really hold it all together as well it's because you believe in that world you believe in the logic of it of course it's science fiction it's crazy stuff it's all set in a galaxy far far away but it all held together for me and i i, I did i did that, that's the good description really it did it did feel like a toy store for a for an audio narrator because there was just there was so much available uh to get your teeth into and to bring to life and uh yeah fantastic very, dang very dangerous toys though in that very case. very dangerous toys no, not what you're put, saying. Not gonna uh, put my hand in that toolbox. <laughs> what you're saying about there being a lot to um, lot to work with. Yeah, I, I that's what I, I did try to do. Like I do like to cram as much as I could into that world. But as well, what you were saying about it being help, being held together. It's not so much that I believe in it, but the characters believe in it, and so that's where I come from. I write about it for every scene I write about it from the character's point of view how do they feel about it what's their take do they have emotional history do they have a context do they have some sort of agenda or do they have some sort of angle uh with this tech uh, with this even whether it's a ship or a different alien species or a suit or tech anything like that it's how do they feel and how can I get this uh across but it's interesting you mentioned Grimm because he was one of the heart in this book one of the harder narrate characters to get right because he is obviously as you said he's got beef because he's from a different uh, he's an outsider from the main establishment uh and he wants to be part of this establishment but at the same time he feels like he wants to hold on to his own identity and his own persona like who he is because if you erase where you come from and where you are and everything that made you are you that same person now uh or are you just someone who's evolved to the point where you don't recognize your former self like i can you look back and say yes this is my history these are my roots i'm comfortable here but this is where i came from uh and what's the cost of that and i especially this it's, it was almost organic that i wrote it that um grim's fears is that he is still an outsider in vakov's uh head that to vakov he is still the enemy because Vakov fought and killed people who came from his planet, who looked like him, who spoke his language. And so is he even says, I think in the book, like, how do you know that that dislike, that resentment isn't deep, deep down inside you? Uh, and I think that's very applicable to a lot of people nowadays. Like we think we don't feel differently about someone or, or especially if they come from a certain cultural background or history and then but something that we do or something that we say reveals that we do have that subconscious or unconscious bias 
inside us and how do you ignore it do you fight it do you accept it do you engage with it and i i it's i don't really have answers for this no. sort of thing i mean especially as it's in i don't think anyone has answers and especially as this is you know hundreds of years in the future and the cultures that don't exist but i did want to transplant those feelings those human raw human emotions those messy sticky ambiguous things that that just bug us and just um you know those things that are in the back of our heads and just transplant that to a far future setting and i did and that's kind of how i wrote from the wrote from well when i was designing these characters you know what is their fears like what's something that bothers them uh because one of my favorite things is making characters who are contradictory you have this very uh ha this hacker guy who is just playful and gets up to mischief and just creates all sorts of gratuitous mayhem wherever he goes uh, and enjoys swindling people and yet is very sensitive and is very worried about how his best friend perceives him. Uh, and so, yeah, and I think that the narration lended a lot of that emotional weight to it. So I'm, I'm very glad that you felt that way, uh, Colin. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes back a bit to the two brothers as well, because it's really interesting what you say about identity. I think that's really a big thing, uh, particularly in the UK at the moment, because we are in the middle of a culture war to do with, um, well, to do with all sorts of things, to do with unconscious bias, to do with movements like, uh, you know, Rainbow Laces, Black Lives Matter, you know, all these th different, uh, and, and obviously uh, the, women's, the women's movement as well. And we're very polarised. We feel very, I feel very, I'm living in a country that's very polarised, partly to do with, I know we're not going to get into sort of politics and stuff, but um, things like Brexit and um, race and immigration and, you know, the, 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 the kind of the crisis in the channel of people trying to get into, the, into England at the moment or into the UK. And it, it does rather throw up that, the idea of what you were just talking about, about identity. And I think that for the two brothers in your book, it's interesting in this book, Blind Space, they have to go back to New Vladivostok, to their home planet, or he has to go back to his home planet, which is, I'm not gonna, not, no spoilers, but uh, they <laughs> revisit their, uh, his home planet. And to go back to his home planet after everything um, that he's been through. And what's interesting, what's great is because in the first book and in this book, I believe, you have flashbacks to their childhood when they were growing up there. So you're kind of, as a reader slash narrator slash listener, you are familiar with that planet, uh, the cold, the bleakness, the kind of, yeah, the, the kind of outpost, the, the, the little shacks, the, the warm bars, the drinking, the violence, the Yakuza, if you like, for want of a better phrase, the kind of local mafia. And they have escaped that in their different ways. And, he has to go back and it's really interesting because it's not an identity that he necessarily want he doesn't want to go and live there again or he does maybe he does but but he doesn't necessarily want to relive be, that part of his life but that is who he is and it's the same for artyom and artyom asks him i think at one point what was it like you know what was it like going back and because that's a an, such an interesting question for for any person that that leaves where they're brought up and, and you know, I don't know if it's the vast majority, but lots and lots of people, not many people just stay in the town they're born in or the village they're born in for, or, or even the country they're born in for the whole of their lives. People move around a lot. And, it, and that idea of identity is a, is a really strong theme, I think, uh, in these two novels. And it's not something that necessarily jumps out at you or hits you on the nose. It's, it's very kind of embedded in the story and in the characters, but it, it's, again, it's, a, it's one of those central things in the book, which is kind of motivating the characters to do the things that they do or choosing to do the things that they do. Not necessarily the bad guys, because they just want universal domination, <laughs> but, but the guys on our, that we're, <laughs> whose, whose side we're on, they're all struggling with that a little bit and having to deal with different species who they have you know have had conflict with or they just naturally don't like and having to overcome all these prejudices and 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 I found all that really it just human I mean it's human it's human stuff right you can set it you know far in the future on crazy planets with crazy tech and all this stuff and all these these you know these these different species with different characteristics but in the end 
the feelings and emotions are just really present and uh, even more present now because I think we, as I say, I think I certainly feel I live in a very polarized uh, country at the moment and it's not comfortable. You know, people are expressing on Twitter, on social media, you know, really, for me, unpalatable views, but they feel that they have the right to, to express those views. They feel they have the right to dislike people because they come from somewhere else and that that's fine because I come from here and this is, you know, all this stuff. And, and it's really current and it's in these books because that's what these people, the characters have to do to overcome their problems. They have to deal with it. And it's very much about either feeling secure in your identity or not secure in your identity. And then what does that make you do? How does that make you feel? What actions is that going to make you take? And, and those questions come up a lot with these characters. And it, again, it, it just adds a whole extra texture to a book that is, uh, you know, is a, is a fantasy science. I'm not sure what, what is, what, what, space what, opera. Space yeah, opera, yeah. Cyberpunk. Space yeah. opera, yeah. And I've not heard that expression before, but it, it has so much depth to it right down to the, you know, the D, the absolute sort of DNA of the characters and the story and everything is motivated from that. And I, I think, I think it's a, it's really an exceptional piece of work. Well, thank you. I, <laughs> interestingly enough, the, what you're talking about when he goes back to New Bloody and, you know, we've spoiled it already, so it doesn't matter, um, that my father is actually from Poland uh, and left Poland. Uh, he left in the seventies, uh, a long story, but he was chased by the army and jumped over the Iron Curtain uh, as a, to Germany. Uh, and we've gone back there since. And that idea of being in a far-flung outpost, lonely place that has had that huge distance between the poor and the rich, between the super advanced technology and old, uh, old you know, Soviet-style tech that's been there since God knows how long, that I did very much seeing his reaction to that, what it's like to go to those places that he saw as a child, those playgrounds and old yeah. bars that were from 40 years ago, unchanged, where you can still go to the post office where there's bullet holes, in, riddled with bullet holes from German and Russian soldiers, and to now see a gaming store right next to it. That, like, that disconnect... Yeah, that is yeah. very, very, very much transplanted into how Vackel feels about New Bloody Vostok, 100%. Yeah. Uh, I didn't plan it that way, but it did turn out very, very much so. Uh, and so I found it's really interesting you pointed that out. And uh, one yeah, other thing... Yeah, I find that very moving. It's, it's, and also, it's just such fertile stuff for writers, I guess. It's very, very fertile, yeah. uh, that, that kind of... Uh, those kind of situations. Yeah, really, really yeah. terrific. Yeah. Before we close this, this one last thing I wanted to mention is that um, what you were saying, Colin, about uh, the characters not changing and in this landscape with all these very, very divided views. And do you admit to yourself that you have nurtured these feelings or do you engage with them? Do you not? That's something that's very much going to be tackled in book three. Uh, it's not a spoiler because I think anyone can see this coming from a mile off. But the idea that Vakov will absolutely do away with all his violent feelings and all his churned up emotions and all his drug addled rage <laughs> is like kidding themselves. If anyone knows <laughs> anything about a human nature, B drugs uh, <laughs> or drug industry for that matter. And so it's actually going to be very interesting to me to, to write it about how I can find the balance between someone who feels some way, some extreme way, and yet, doesn't combat it, doesn't ignore it, but engages with it and finds peace with it. If he finds peace with it, I'm not spoiling that, but there is just, it's very much going to tackle that. And as you saw said, all those other characters that feel a certain way about other cultures or species, about how they engage with it. Like, do they ignore it? Do they say goodbye to it? Or are they content with not being okay with it? I mean, there are people who will not forgive something that was done to them, but they are content to not forgive. They found their peace with it. And there are other people who will simply walk away and forget it ever happened. Uh, so what will I do? Well, to be continued. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to it. Absolutely. Well, um, Jeremy, Colin, thank you all so much for, for coming in and, and chatting about Blind Space, about the Common series uh, as a whole so far. Um, and definitely looking forward to uh, book three, which 
I assume Colin is also going to be narrating, so that, that would be definitely be something to see. So anybody that hasn't had a chance to, to check them out, so Stormblood is book one, Blind Space is book two. Colin Mace has narrated both of them, so definitely check it out if you enjoy audiobooks or if you just want to get a physical copy for yourself. Um, Colin, just thank you so much for being just an amazing narrator and in like making my audible subscription so worth it because <laughs> I just whenever your voice comes on I just love hearing it and I just know I'm in for a treat whenever uh, you narrate one of the audiobooks for a book I'm looking forward to so just thank you so much and thank you for you know taking the time just it's my pleasure I can't stop fanboying <laughs> <laughs> and Jeremy it's been a pleasure as always man I always love thank talking you, David. to you um best of luck uh, writing book three but like yeah, we, we talked about the other day, please, please take some time for yourself. <laughs> so um, y'all be good. Well, maybe we can do this again sometime. Maybe I won't be good, but be, okay. Be awesome. So no y'all, worries. Uh, y'all have a great rest of your week. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. Take care. Take care, guys. Take care.